it's important for all of you to know that Father Ben's work spreads much beyond the walls of this place. Since graduating from Virginia Theological Seminary in May, I've been serving as a chaplain at St. Stephen's and St. Agnes School in Alexandria, Virginia. School chaplaincy is proving to be a thrilling vocation. Those of you with kids of any age know that kids rarely slow down. It has been fun to at least try to keep up with the energy of teenagers. Another joy of my current placement is that in such a large institution, I get to interact with people of many different faith and religious backgrounds, and I get to interact with people with many different vocational callings. I particularly enjoy the relationships that I have established with some of the coaches at the school. Last week, our middle school basketball team had a game at a boys school in Bethesda, Maryland. When the coaches pulled up to this school in Bethesda, they saw a sign at the entrance to the school. The sign read, are you delivering your son's forgotten lunch, his sports equipment, his binder or homework? Please turn around and save yourself from the walk of shame. <laughs> your son will learn to be independent and responsible if you don't bring these forgotten items to school to bail him out even if you sincerely believe that it's your fault and not his. <laughs> he will not starve, lose his starting position, fail out of school, or lose his chance to become president, something we might need, because he does not have the item you are thinking of delivering. Please let him grow up to be the great griffin we know he can be. Thanks, have a great day, your friendly president and headmaster. At its core, that sign is about temptation. I certainly don't think parents can be faulted for wanting to do all that they can do for their children. Even so, sometimes our most well-intentioned actions are misplaced. There is a temptation for parents of young children to protect them from all the pain and sorrow in this world. There is a temptation to keep our loved ones so tight, so close to us that we don't allow them to grow into the individual, responsible, authentic people that they are called to be. Following Ash Wednesday services this week, we arrive here today on the first Sunday in Lent. Whichever lectionary cycle we are in, whichever of the three years we are in, this first Sunday in Lent always presents us with the temptation of Jesus in the desert. This first Sunday of Lent is all about temptation. In Luke's account of the temptation of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, that pesky Holy Spirit that was with us at the Transfiguration, leads Jesus into the wilderness where he is tempted by the devil. First, the devil tempts Jesus by saying, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus does not turn the stone into bread. Then the devil tempts Jesus again saying, to you I will give their glory and all this authority if you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus tells the devil that we are only to worship the Lord our God. <coughs> Lastly, the devil takes Jesus to Jer Jerusalem and tempts him by saying, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus then tells the devil not to put the Lord your God to the test. That answer seems to appease the devil, at least for the time being. It is worthy for us to focus on Jesus' human experience of temptation this first Sunday in Lent. 
The three temptations presented to Jesus in the wilderness could be seen as social, political, and religious temptations. Turning stone into bread would quite easily help those who were hungry in Jesus' day, a social temptation. Taking on all authority in the kingdoms of the world, a political temptation. And being placed at the pinnacle of the temple in Jerusalem, a religious temptation. Jesus wants the hungry to be fed, no doubt. Jesus wants the Roman Empire to be overturned, no doubt. Jesus wants the religious abuses of his time to be terminated, no doubt. The devil knows what Jesus wants, so the devil tempts Jesus. Ultimately, though, had Jesus accepted those temptations offered to him, he would have denied himself the ability to receive the greatest gift he would receive from God, the gift of new life, resurrection life. Like Jesus, perhaps our greatest temptation that we must resist this Lenten season is the temptation to deny ourselves the ability to receive the gifts that God gives us each and every day. Turning to our reading from the book of Deuteronomy that we heard a few moments ago, I want to highlight the giving nature of God in that passage. In the context of the exile of the Israelites, new life came in the form of land. Remember, going back to the book of Genesis, God promises not only offspring to Abraham, but land with it, saying to your descendants, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. And then to Moses, God promises that he will deliver the Israelites out of the land of Egypt. There in the book of Exodus, God says to Moses, Go, leave this place, you and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt, and go to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your descendants I will give it. Now we arrive at the book of Deuteronomy. In just 11 short verses of scripture, we hear that God gives a gift of land six times. Verse 1, when you have come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess. Verse 2, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Verse 3, today I declare to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. Verse 9, and he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Verse 10, so now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground that you, O Lord, have given me. And if you don't believe me yet, verse 11. Then you, together with the Levites and the aliens who reside among you, shall celebrate with all the bounty that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house. After the sixth reference of giving of land from God, you get the point. God gives the Israelites new life in the form of land, and most importantly, they receive it. God gives Jesus new life in the form of resurrection life, and most importantly, he receives it. In his letter to the Romans, Paul tells us, The word is near you on your lips and in your hearts. The word is near us, on our lips and in our hearts. In a few moments, all of us will be presented with new life during the Holy Eucharist. Upon consecrating the bread and wine, I will follow the liturgy of the Book of Common Prayer and say the gifts of God for the people of God. The body and blood of Jesus Christ are the gifts of God. You all are the people of God. 
The temptation will be to think that we ourselves can turn stones into bread to save the world. The temptation will be to think that we ourselves can rule the political halls of Warrington and Washington with more authority than God. And the temptation will be to think that our religious institutions, particularly this Episcopal institution, can sit at the pinnacle of the temple in Jerusalem above all else. Instead, returning to the Eucharistic feast over and over again will cleanse us of all evil temptations and put our trust back in God such that we can receive what God gives us. On this first Sunday in Lent, we are called to resist the temptation to deny new life from touching our lips and entering our hearts. We are the people of God. We are about to receive the gifts of God. The word is near you on your lips and in your hearts. I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.